So like I said before, this is the first lecture where you can actually see me lecturing due to the webcam. So if, if you, um, this is at a student's request. So let's see if um, this satisfies them. Because they said the, uh, that I really emote in class and they don't really see that when they listen to the lecture at home and that this will help them learn better. Um, so continuing chapter nine, analyst behavior. So analysts like to look at what we call the herding behavior. So have you ever seen a wildlife video where a herd, a herd type of animals run together, protect themselves from predators, and there are, they have shown uh, clips where if one of the lead herd animals runs off a cliff, all the other animals will follow and run off the cliff. You know, so that's akin to what happens in the stock market where there are many investors, small investors, uneducated investors who are playing, getting into the stock market late because the bull market is doing so well. And they run into the stock market, they put a lot of money in, and they just follow each other. So they usually are the ones buying at the top of the market. Uh, so they buy high. And then when the market starts to go down, they get upset quickly and they sell low. So it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing in a long position. So analysts like to measure and look at the herd uh, behavior uh, and spot trends and kind of get an idea using the odd lots because the round lots of the professional investors trade in the round lots and the unprofessional people trade in the odd lots. So they can kind of tell by the amount of odd lot activity who is buying the stock and who is selling the stock. Um, Now, the analysts themselves tend to be sort of a, a mini herd themselves. Uh, think of it this way. One analyst does this great, very detailed analysis report on a stock and says that you should buy the stock. Now, another analyst who's also covering the stock, you know, wants to take an early vacation or a long lunch and basically just reads over the first analyst report and kind of like you guys would do for a paper, paraphrase it move some sentences around, uh, add a little bit of context to it, and there, there's, a, there's his analyst report. But it's really just uh, regurgitated work from someone else's sources. A lot when, just like if you're writing a research report, you're not actually doing the research, so you're collecting data from other researchers and just putting it together and restating it or paraphrasing it in the paper. You're not plagiarizing, but you're representing the information. And a lot of analysts will do that too. So if you get you know, so if one analyst is, uh, one or two analysts makes, you know, a pretty well detailed, documented analysis of why you should buy the stock and they publish it, other analysts will take the shortcut, read that over and kind of, you know, finish that on a Monday and have the rest of the week off. So if you're covering 50 stocks, you know, these analysts sometimes take shortcuts. And the problem is you don't have enough people looking at the stock enough analysts. You may only have a few original analysts and then a hundred people following or copying them. So then you could have all, all of these, you know, stocks with a lot of buy recommendations from analysts and you say, well, how can 20 analysts be wrong? So in 1999, when Yahoo was $50 and 20 analysts said buy Yahoo and nobody said would sell Yahoo, what were you to think as a, as a regular investor? Oh, I, I guess I should buy it if 20 analysts are all giving it five stars and saying this is a stock to buy. Six months later, it's at $7, I guess. How could all 20 of them be wrong? Well, it was probably one or two of them that were, were wrong, and the other uh, 18 just copied or paraphrased, took the easy way out. There's also a problem back in 99 where the analysts work for the companies. Um, a lot of them work for investment or audit-related companies that actually did business with some of the stocks, so they were actually pressured to give good analyst reviews to stocks because the parent company was also doing business with them. That has since been uh, corrected, but there was a big um, problem with that in, you know, 1999-2000 where the analysts were under pressure from the parent company who was doing business with some of these companies on other levels not to give them you know, sell recommendations. There was really, they weren't as independent as they should have been. Okay. Um, so if you want to use the idea of behavioral uh, finance to improve your results, some things that you could start with really worry about your own behavior first. Don't worry about other stock people's behavior. Think about your own behavior. 
the first thing that you have to fight against is the hesitation to sell a losing stock. And this is, I've dealt with this many times, and it's just sometimes you buy a stock, you're so sure it's going to do well, and it keeps disappointing. And it keeps doing worse and worse. And then you get to the point where you just have to really say, okay, I made a mistake. i got to get rid of this and just sell it and move it into a better stock. Because a lot of you will want to wait and say, I, this stock will do better eventually. I'm just going to hold on to it. And you would have held on, have to hold, if you bought Yahoo in 1999 for $50 and it went down, and you said, well, I'm going to hold on until it, until it comes back. Well, you know what? 14 years later, it finally came back. But what did you miss out? I mean, your money did come back 14 years later. Yahoo stocks, you know, close to where it was in 1999. I guess, I guess you proved yourself right. But you know what? In that 14 years, you could have had that money in other stocks like Google or uh, Yelp or Chipotle Mexican Grill or even some mutual funds and done uh, much better than just breaking even on, you know, you just basically broke even on Yahoo. But you could have taken the money you had left over in Yahoo, invested in some of these other investments, and made two, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred percent returns. That's what you're missing if you hold on to a stock that's not performing. And that's a whole adage from Peter Lynch: "Don't pick the flowers and leave the weeds." You know. Yeah, you had a question. You hold this, if the stock's doing well, you hold it for long term. You don't, you don't sell it. You know, there could be some small bumps up and down, and you just can't watch the stock every day. You know, stocks that you know are going to be good for long term, you hold for long term. And if there's a point where you feel like the stock is going down, um, it, it can be tough. But if it's going down because the market's going down, and it's not, go it's not going down because the stock's bad, maybe it's going down because there's a market correction or market crash or some reason like that, that's not a reason to sell a stock. If the, if the market's going down and you're a long-time holder and it's, the company's still great and still going to make profits, still going to be a good future, like say like a company like Chipotle Mexican Grill, that's probably going to have a good 10-year expansion or Under Armour or something like that. But these stocks can get crushed during a market downturn. You know, when Under Armour got crushed in 2008 and went down to $11 a share, instead of selling it, I bought more. Because I knew that Under Armour was still a great stock. All the fundamentals were there. Everything was good. It was just a market movement. So if the stock's going down because of market influences, that's not a reason to sell. That's maybe a reason to buy more. Um, you only want to sell that stock if it's going down because the company's going down. You know, there's something wrong with it. People that, you know, the competition has eroded their competitive advantage or the company is just, you know, this disruptive technology changing the environment, that's when you want to sell. Not because the market corrected 20%. That's an opportunity to buy. No. Um, don't chase performance. And this is more true in mutual funds and stocks, but it's true for both. You see, you, he, you see one of those news reports, you look, uh, you maybe get once you have a 401k, they'll give you a listing of 20 mutual funds to, to choose from. And most people will buy whatever mutual fund did well last year, you know, or did well for the last two years. But the mutual fund cycle and different sectors do better every year. So bu typically buying the sector that did the best last year probably won't do the best again next year. It's very rare for them to have back-to-back, -back, especially three back-to-back -back years where they're the top sector. Sometimes it's better to buy the sector that had that... Uh, went down the most because they're about ready for a rebound. And it, uh, now, in stocks, some chasing performance in stocks is sort of like you find a really hot stock, like um, that, that camera company, that mobile. The yeah, the GoPro. That stock has had a lot of, uh, I think, upward momentum. At one point, it's getting close to 100. It might have pulled back now down to 80 or 60. I haven't followed it too closely. But that would be a stock where people, if they chase the performance of that stock and it really ballooned that fast out of nowhere, and you're, and you're buying it just because it's the number one you know, movement stock the last two months, everybody else is buying it for that reason too. And then the, the real smart traders who got it early are going to realize now it's time for profit taking and they're going to move out of it. So you don't want to keep moving your money from hot stock to hot stock and then it goes down, you get disappointed and you move to the next hot thing. Um, it's not good to chase the performance. You want to you you chase 
the companies who are about to perform. You know, that's where all the money is made. So if you find a company before they really take off, before everybody knows about them, before their really solid performance has come in, that's when you get the most stock appreciation. It's sort of like Tesla. Tesla was at $35, $40. But if you would have known that, hey, this is going to be a great company. They're going to make a lot of cars. They're going to sell a lot of cars. You could have got in. This is only, you know, a year or, or maybe 16 months ago they were trading at this price. And then suddenly they started selling cars and having uh, good increases in sales once their, their models are ready and they're going to make a new lower end model. Um, and suddenly the stock goes up to $240, $300 because now everybody's jumping on top of it and chasing the performance of that stock. Uh, you need to be humble and open minded. You have to keep your ego in check. Nobody knows everything. You don't know everything. Um, and some things that you think may be wrong or don't work, maybe they do work. You know, there, there are a lot of concepts, there are a lot, a lot of information that uh, you may be already prejudiced against that can't work, that's not a good way to do, do it, or, you know, but you, you'd be surprised to be open-minded. You know, a quick example is, uh, you know, when you get older, you become very close-minded to any type of new TV show. And you wind up basically just watching CBS. It just shows, you know, 16 NCISs and CISs and, you know, the same stuff over and over again because you don't want to see anything new. But you're missing out on a lot of good, you know, television. There's still some people today that are resistant to watching Breaking Bad, which is like the best TV show in the past 15 years because, you know, they just don't have an open mind about it. Oh, I don't want to watch, that's too, you know, I don't want to watch that show. Or even another example is The Walking Dead, which is a pretty big show. But still, there's a lot of people who won't even try it, you know, because they said, That's, I don't like that type of show. Um, but most people who do try it get hooked on it and, and can't believe that they like a show like that. Right. Are you a big fan? No? You should try it. Be open-minded. Um, review the performance of your investments on a periodic basis, meaning... The worst thing to do is review your performance every day because that's going to put you in a situation where you're going to sell it prematurely or buy more when you shouldn't. You need a little bit more distance if you're going to be uh, um, a little bit more objective. Not much has changed in a week or a day or two weeks or even a month. You know? So most people would advise to review your stock holdings maybe once a quarter or four times a year. You know? Not every day, because then you start really um, overthinking the matter. And that will just lead you to buying or selling at the wrong time. And that leads right into my next one. Don't trade too much, because trading too much loses you money. More commissions, more mistakes. You want to trade when you're ready, and you, and you probably want to trade and maybe in a little bit more shares, maybe 1,000 shares rather than 100. So that way you can reduce your commissions somewhat. Um, and hopefully, if you're like me, and I'm very patient, it's all about patience. And you just kind of wait until the time is right. And then um, it's sort of like if you ever look for to buy a used car, and you maybe check, you, you look for a number of used cars, and then one, and the one time you, you, know, you find one that's, okay, this is it. But there were nine others that you were like, this could have been it. I'm not sure. It's the same thing when you buy a house. Um, uh, or even when maybe a smaller purchase that you make more frequently when you buy clothes. You shouldn't buy a piece of clothing until you're, uh, unless you really, well, this I got to have. Not like, I think this could look good. And then you buy it, you never wear it. Or you do wear it and it winds up looking like this. But you got to wear it anyway because you got to prove yourself right that it was a good purchase, you know. So you don't want to you don't want to trade too impulsively. You don't want to go clothes shopping too impulsively. You want to buy what you're going to utilize and what's going to be best for you. Okay. Now technical analysis is we're going to move into this area, which is a lot of people will say boo to technical analysis. It's witchcraft. It's astrology. It's, you, you know, this doesn't work. And then to that I say, well, most of the traders use technical analysis and all the news, 
all the stock news analysis shows use technical analysis. There are a lot of books on technical analysis. And I myself personally have made a, um, most of the correct timing choices in my portfolios due to technical analysis. So the way I kind of use it, I don't think you should use it by itself. I think it works good with fundamental analysis. So you do the homework, you learn the financial statements and ratios, you understand which companies are the strongest financially um, and strategically, and then use technical analysis to show you when the window of, of opportunity opens up to purchase it. So you might know that Chipotle Mexican Grill or Panera Bread are two great stocks that perform very well, but they're, you know, they're always high priced, just like Google and Apple. So when is the right time to go in and buy it? Technical analysis helps to identify those right times. So um, there is a time where there wasn't much financial data or any timely financial data. So that's why people gravitated a little bit more towards technical analysis. So investors can only watch the stock market and the stock charts and the volume and the movement of stock prices. So they, they figured out a way to determine buy or sell decisions based on the movement or the signals that the stock gives off. So investors started making and keeping char charts of the stock market to look for patterns and formations to help indicate whether to buy or sell, sort of looking for signs. So like you look into the sky and you see a lot of clouds forming, you're, you're probably forecasting rain. Or if you look in the sky and it's clear and, and it's sunny, probably we figure that, okay, I could go out my sailboat today, it's not going to rain. That's, you know a very slight form of technical analysis. You're using signals that the environment gives you, whether it's the weather environment or the stock environment, to get an idea of what your future actions should be. You know. There are, and with the weather, there's all sorts of signals about the color of the sky and um, the direction of the wind, the different things that could that give you an idea of where the weather is. You know, sometimes um, you'll see seagulls be more inland than rather at the shore. And then people would say, oh, a storm is coming. Because when the seagulls fly closer inland and they don't want to hang out on the coast, they're worried about, you know, a storm, looking for shelter. Or some animals that run, start running past you, running away, and you're like, where are these animals running for? And then suddenly an earthquake hits or a tsunami hits. Because they know they can read the signals better than you can about what's happening and they react faster. So if you see an elephant running, follow him. So studies have shown anywhere from 20% to 50% of the stock's price behavior can be traced back to overall market forces. So technical analysis is the study of these forces in the marketplace that's going to be the effect on stock price. So we're going to look at trends in business, um, stock prices and overall stock market, we're going to look at stock prices as a function of supply and demand. And since, you know, all stock prices have that supply and demand element through the buying and trading, buying and selling and the trading of the stock. So that's going to have, throw off certain telltale signs. Um, general sense where the stock market is going in the next few months. And you might have seen this, well, this last month when the stock market was going down and up, was kind of volatile. There are a lot of news shows talking about the technical trends putting up uh, S&P 500 index, index averages and looking at the charts and measuring the percentages up and down and trying to show resistance and support and predict where stock prices were going and where the support would be. So they can sometimes they try to predict how low the stock market will go before support comes in and people start buying and it'll bounce and how high it will go and how you can use these technical indicators together. So the confidence index, this is one technical indicator where we could look at the, uh, the ratios between yields of the high-grade corporate bonds compared to the intermediate corporate bonds. So basically, we think about bonds are money lent to corporations at interest rates. So the riskier the company, the more junk bond status it gets. And the better the company, the more high-grade the bond gets. So the idea is that you know, you charge less interest to the better borrowers, the more stable companies, but you charge more interest to the, the companies who aren't as um, stable financially to compensate you for your risk, sort of like a corporate credit score. Now, when the spread 
um, the spread between these interest rates can tell us optimism or pessimism. So if uh, junk bonds are at 5% and high yield bonds are at 10%, you know, we would say that's kind of pessimistic because there's a, a big yield spread between uh, the higher yield and the lower yield bonds. So it, and then in time we're looking and we see that um, maybe the high yield bonds are at 8% and the low yield bonds, um, I'm sorry, this would be the more junk bond, this would be the higher grade. So the, the junk bonds go down from 10 to 8% and maybe the high yield bonds, uh, we'll, we'll move the junk bonds down to say 6% and the high yield down to 4 So interest rates have gone lower, but the junk bonds have gone down a lot quicker than the high yield bonds. So now the spread, instead of being five, 500 basis points or 5% interest, it's only um, 200 basis points or 2% interest spread between the junk and the high end bonds. So when the yields start to become closer, they said to be uh, more optimism, less risk in the stock market. Because they're not, when the economy looks riskier or the economy looks like it's, it's going to be more um, of a contracting, they'll start, the junk bonds will start to go up a lot faster in the amount of interest rates they're charging them than the high yield. Because they, they see more risk. And when the economy is doing poorly, the smaller, the more weaker companies are the ones that typically um, go bankrupt. So looking at these spreads can give us a confidence index saying that this is a confidence market, a more confident market when the base is only 200 basis points between high yield and junk. When it's 500 basis points between high yield and junk, we'll say the market's not so confident, that they expect the economy to be worse. So using, basically we're using the bond market as a predictor of the economy uh, and a predictor of how well stocks would do. If they feel that all companies are going to do well, you'll have a much tighter spread in interest rates versus when they feel that companies are not going to do well. So the bond market is what they consider smarter money than the stock market because the average person doesn't trade bonds. The average person is more likely to trade stocks than they would be to trade bonds. And we're not talking bonds in the mutual fund. We're talking straight out buying and selling bonds off the market. You know, so people, it takes a little bit more sophisticated of an investor with a little bit more money to buy and sell bonds uh, but anybody can buy and sell stocks. So the smart money would say is in the bond market, it shows up first before it's in the stock market. So if you see that people are betting that companies are going to be doing well and yields are going lower on corporate and all, all levels of corporate bonds, we can translate into stock prices are going to go up. So it's one of the technical indicators. And it's sort of, you know, right now interest rates are all pretty, f pretty low as far as what you get paid in a bank account or a, a certificate of deposit. Uh, or a municipal fund, or a treasury, car loan, or mortgage. Uh, so when it get, can get confusing if the Fed is lowering rates uh, and everything is in a lower rate environment, sometimes these spreads can be more narrow, but you have to look at the rate environment you're in to get a better idea of you know, how much change would indicate a move in the stock market. And that's the tricky part, because right now we have a very condensed interest rate structure where everything's pretty low. Uh, there was a time where you know, a bank account would typically pay 5% interest, and now it's 0.005%, if any interest. All right. So market volume. Uh, this is the amount of shares that are being bought and sold. So when we talk about market volume, this is the adding, you sell 100 shares, you buy 200 shares, the volume is 300. So you just add the buy and sell shares together. Uh, now, a strong market is when volume uh, is up, we call it a strong market, and a weak market is when we say volume is down. Now, when we, when we measure this up with the amount of what we call the breadth of the market, the amount, if the stock market shares are going higher, um, we call that an advancing um, market, or the, the advances are outnumbering the declines. So what we really like is a strong market, high volume, and stock prices moving higher. That would be the best situation. Uh, a weak market is when 
the number of declining stocks outpace the number of advancing stocks. So a bad sign is high volume on a weak market, where most is a high volume and most stocks are going lower. If there's a very low volume and most stocks are going lower, majority of the stocks are going down, not up, that's not so, th so threatening or so worrisome because it's not a big participation. If we have a huge participation, a very strong market, high volumes and high sell-offs, that's denoting more of a significant trend downward. So we look at, we look at just to back up, the market volume to be the participation or the amount of interest in the stock market. You know, is it a billion shares, two billion, 10 billion shares? And then we look at the direction, where we should look at the amount of shares moving higher versus the amount of shares moving lower to give us an idea of how significant the strong or weak market is. So ideally we want a strong market, heavy trading volume on a day where advances outnumber the declines. And that would be a strong technical indicator to keep buying stocks because people are moving in in masses to move up the stock park market. Now short interest is we talked about short selling before and when we look at Yahoo Finance under the key statistics, you can get a percentage, you can get the total number of shares sold short and a percentage of the float that's sold short. So the short interest looks at the number of stocks that have been short at any given time. And normal range is, you know, one to five percent of the shares are sold short, which really isn't so troublesome. But some stocks get up into 10, 15, 20 percent of their shares are sold short, which means that most people are betting the stock price is going to go down. And when we say most people, we mean most of the advanced investors because the average investors don't sell short. Generally, the advanced investors sell short. So when we have an increasing amount of short interest, then we know that the stock, the, the, the more experienced traders are saying this stock is doomed. It's, it's, I'm going to make money on the way down. So it's a measure of the future demand for the stock. So if the short interest is increasing, the future demand for buying the stock is going to decline. Um, now, if the shorts get uh, out of control, the short percentages get too high, then they have to buy and cover at some point. So they can actually create additional demand for the stock later on. So if, if you know, if 70% of the, share, the shares are sold short and the stock starts to go down, they'll start to buy the cover. And that can actually stabilize and push the stock up. So these, this, this really denotes optimism and pessimism. So when the, when the short interest is growing from single digits to double digit percentages of sh all shares outsol outstanding sold short, that's pessimistic. People are feeling the stock has reached a peak or is likely to go down. And when the short interest starts to contract, that's more optimistic about the stock's future. So if you're following a stock, and a lot of these indicators require you to follow or investigate the stock for long periods of time. And sort of like if I was going to look at short interest, I'd look at what's the stock's average short interest over the past five years. And maybe it'll give me 4%. So the stock short interest above 4%, I would say that, okay, that's getting a little pessimistic. If it was below 4%, I'd say the stock traders are feeling a little bit more optimistic. So sometimes you want an average, what's the stock's average short position? Because different industries and different stocks will have different averages that can be higher or lower. So you really want to get a feel for what's, sort of like what's the average temperature of the stock to, get know, to know whether or not the stock is overheated or cooling down. Uh, and that's where the short interest can work best is when you really get a feel for the dynamics of the stock and where the, sh where the comfortable short percentage range exists. And when that starts expanding or changing greatly, we know that it's either a buy or sell opportunity. So if we go to key statistics, this will give us, McDonald's should have a low short percentage because it's so well established and um, it's a type of thing that, you know, most people would figure, okay, so down, oh, up here a little bit. Yeah, their short, their short percentage of float is 1.2%, which is very low, but characteristic of McDonald's. We look at a company like we were talking about, this company that makes the hazmat suits that's in Lake Ronkonkoma. I always like it when people who aren't from Long Island try to say Ronkonkoma, pronounce it. 
It makes me wish I lived in Ronkonkoma, so then people would be like trying to pronounce it all the time. Uh, Ronkonkoma. That's how my uh, GPS pronounces it. Continue to Ronkonkoma. All right. So here, the short interest is 44% of the stock is sold short. That's an astonishingly high short interest for the stock. But you can understand because this is a very volatile stock. If you look at the, um, the chart, the stock has been up and down quite a bit. So here is, um, let's, do, uh, let's do a one month on this chart. And we could see that, uh, I'm going to move the chart over a bit. All right. So at the beginning of the month, we were at $30, and then down, up, down, up. You can see, you know, quite a volatility uh, on the stock and a lot of that I think is due to the short sells so the shorts once the stock was very high not only if they owned it they sold it and then they sold the short on top of it because it's a very trendy uh, stock that was based on fear of Ebola and things like that for the hazmat suits so a stock like um, this lake or Lakeland I think is what they call it you'll see a very high 44% I think is like the highest I've ever seen so that would be a reason to stay away from a stock like that. So short interest can give you a good idea of how people are feeling about the stock. Now, when you have a high short percentage like 44%, that might actually be a good spot to buy the stock because eventually those people are going to want to cover and get recover their money. And if they don't feel, they're probably they're probably thinking the stock will go back down to $7, where it was before all this crisis was started. And if that happens, they'll probably, that'll probably be the point where they'll start selling to lock in their profits. So I would say technically the stock would be good to buy it back around 7 or 8 or 9, where it kind of started all this craziness, because that's where the shorts are most likely to go and recover and try to um, sell, I mean buy their, reverse their short sell to lock in their profit. And it'll probably bounce the stock back up from 8 back to 13 or 15 as they're reversing all their positions and creating more demand. Because remember, this is a tiny stock. It has a very, amount, very small amount of outstanding shares. Okay. Uh, contrary opinion and odd law trading, I talked about this somewhat before. We look at the measure, use the odd law trading to measure the volume of the small traders in the market. And we assume that the small traders keep making the same mistakes. So we should do the opposite of what the small traders do. So the small traders who trade in, in odd lots, they tend to panic and sell when the market's very low. Because they see that their, their, their stock accounts have lost 50, 40% of their value, and they're panicky, and they just, they just have had it with stocks, and they eventually just give up and sell. And it pushes the market even lower, which causes more of these small investors to get frustrated and panic and sell. And this is where we want to buy as more educated investors, buy, in, buy into the panic. So you want, to, you want to buy when everyone is fearful, and you want to sell when people are not fearful. So at the, you know, when the, we're at the top of the market, and a market reaches a new high, or people are just... Um, I knew it was time to sell stocks in 1999 when the gas station attendant was giving me stock advice, along with my gasoline. And the mailman, everybody was talking stocks and was into stocks, and that's when I knew that it's time to get out of stocks. You know, if I go to a party and everybody, they find out, oh, you teach investments at Stony Brook, I want to talk to you, I, you know, I'm so popular and everybody wants to talk to me, that's when I sell stocks. When I go to a party and no one wants to talk to me or be, about, or be reminded about how poorly their 401ks and their IRAs are doing, that's when you, I know it's time to buy. So that's, and, and that comes straight from Peter Lynch, who made those original arguments. He was a very famous mutual fund manager. Uh, because you want to do the opposite of what the small investor is doing, because they continually make the same mistakes over and over. You know, uh, We have these things, we've talked about this for bull and bear markets. 
um, a bull market will say when odd lot sales significantly outnumber odd lot purchases. So if the small investor is selling, that we would, we would consider a bull market. We want to buy into their selling. And if the odd lots, the small investors are significantly purchasing, um, then that's what we call a bear market, and we want to start uh, selling when they're purchasing. Do the opposite of the small investor. This is just uh, one of the charts from the textbook that gives you the uh, advances and declines. So if you look into the stock market, it can tell you, and this you can get also very successfully from Yahoo Finance. So we go to um, Yahoo Finance if you want something that's more up to date and it'll have uh, market data. And let's see. Yep. Well, this is giving me the uh, top performing uh, stocks gainers and losers, but it's not specifically what I want to see. What if I go to market data stocks? Okay. Yeah, this is what I wanted to see. And we could, um, I think this is again, the market movers. Here we go. Here are the advanced, so market data and then specifically stocks. Today we could see that um, the advances are outperforming the declines. 52% of the stocks are advancing, 45% are declining. 148 stocks have new highs, 15 stocks have new lows on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, on the NASDAQ, something similar, 54 to 42%, and 138 new highs to 53 new lows. And we look at the volume. Uh, the up volume, this actually breaks out the volume on the stocks that are moving up compared to the volume the stocks are moving down. And they're actually kind of similar. So there's, I wouldn't say there's too much of a volume indicator today. And actually, this is giving me what the analysts think. So I like to look at rising volumes, uh, rising stock prices on unusual volumes. So this tells me the stock prices that have very f high rising uh, volume. So the volume is up 88%, 70%. And then I like to look at the stocks that have, um, are increasing their stock price in very high rising volume. So that tells me that there's some piece of information that's out there telling people that you should start buying the stock. So they are moving into the stock at very higher than unusual volumes and it's pushing the stock price in most cases higher. Although there's two stocks here that are going lower. So that would want me raise some interest as, okay, why is so many people in suddenly interested in the stock? What's the reason? And you investigate it. Maybe it's earnings release. Maybe a big contract was released um, that they announced or some sort of reason. And the, the best of all, when you can't find any reason, then that's inside information. So that, that way you can kind of figure out, okay, people kind of know what's going on. I'm going to go and let me get jump on this stock because something's happening here that hasn't become public yet, but enough people know they're pushing the volume up. That's how I know that insider trading is real. I see it happening. Okay. So Yahoo is a good, a good place to get the tech, the basic technicals of the market. Now the advanced decline, um, when we talk about trading rules, we can look at advanced decline line. So we were just talking about before the actual market, the number of stocks that were moving up today which we have like 150 uh, to 38 or something like that. And we want to measure the difference between the stocks closing higher um, compared to the stocks closing lower in the previous day. Uh, so the difference can be plotted on a chart. So we can kind of use that as our buy and sell signal. So the bull market is when advances keep outnumbering declines. So we keep, you know, putting that pin in the chart and if it keeps moving higher and we're getting more and more advances every day and less and less declines that will pin keep them moving higher. The bear market is when the declines start to outnumber the advances and we get more of a declining uh, chart where there's more and more declines, more and more stocks are going down every day and that would be a good signal of a, of a bear market. And one day we were watching this bear market and suddenly this the chart, the chart will shift 
and show momentum upward where the, the advances are starting to now outnumber the declines. When that first starts to change, that's when you want to buy. So right now we have, for the past um, year or so, we've had more stocks advancing than declining. And suddenly when we see a shift, we're going to want to go in, and that might be a signal to sell stocks. Although it could be a false signal, because last month we had a, a shift, and stocks went down a, a, a nice percentage, 10% or more, and that could have been, okay, there's a signal to start selling stocks. And the problem is that that shifted the other way. It was a temporary, it wasn't really a permanent change. It was just a month-long temporary, even a three-week-long temporary shift um, that was, didn't have a lot of momentum beyond three weeks. And typically, we see that in a, in a, bear mar in a bull market that we have right now, Every quarter, a couple of weeks before earnings, you'll see a downward shift in stock prices because people will be waiting, saying this could be the quarter where earnings don't, don't uh, impress anymore. They start to disappoint. So there's a lot of nervousness going into earnings. And then once you get a couple of weeks into earnings season and people agree, hey, earnings are still good. They're, they're doing better than we thought. Then the market quickly turns around. And that's what we saw. We saw fear in the beginning measured by the VIX, a volatility index that measures fear in the marketplace. We saw the fear developing and the, and, and the stock prices go down like 800,000 points on the Dow. And then earnings started to come out and were good and that quickly reversed and the Dow went up 1,000 points, 1,100 points, even made up and, and moved higher because the earnings came out and were good and now, you know, earnings are only like a month long and then we have two months where there's really no news. So there's no reason, there's no fear because you really only have to worry that first couple of weeks of earnings come out, if they're really poor, that will tank the stock market. And all, and all major stock crashes happen usually in that earnings period. Yes? Now, I am so long term in a lot of my positions, I don't really get into the day to day or the, 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 the earnings. I don't really worry about the earnings gyrations. I'm just invested right now long, long term. So that frees me up from any worry of stock prices going down or going up. I may worry about our virtual stock market more than I do my actual account. You know? And with the whisper numbers or the, the guidance or what people are saying, I mean, that stuff can make you crazy. But it, for some people, they do find a lot of success in trading on that. And again, you just have to make yourself an expert of it. You, know? you ever meet these people that can be an expert on different various subjects, like maybe it's a TV show and they know every episode and everybody who was in, e in a TV show and what years it was on. Uh, or maybe it's like a comic book series and they know every character in the comic book and all what happened in different key issues. You know, someone's an expert on something. You know, maybe it's music, maybe it's Led Zeppelin and you know every Led Zeppelin album that came out and the years they came out and the songs in every album, right? Um, so you need to become that level of expert on whatever it is the area you're interested in stocks. You get to know it so well that at a certain point in time, you start to be able to be the better predictor of that signal. And that's what really is the, is the key to all these technical indicators is that you become very knowledgeable and observe them for long periods of time, and then you'll be better off in being able to predict their movements. Just like people can predict the weather by the environmental changes. Uh, new highs and lows, we looked at that before, and again, we want to see that um, the new highs are outlowing, outnumbering the lows, that's a bull market, and when the lows, the new stocks hitting new lows start to outnumber the new highs, it's more of a bear market. And remember, not every stock is going to be on this indicator because it has to hit a new all-time high to be a, a, a new high, or an all-time low. So these are really, you know, what we call outliers in the stock market. And right now, for the most part, we see more all-time highs than we do all-time lows. So we're in what we call right now, we're in a bull market. Um, and we usually measure it in a year. So we call the 52-week high, 52-week low, not you know, all-time high for a lifetime. We usually look at it in a year period. And we can even plot these in, on charts or moving day average charts where we just add up the last 10, the number of new highs for the last 10, 10 days, make an average and plot on the chart and compare it to the lows. So th this again is, if we keep seeing more and more all-time new highs, then we know that the markets, bull markets moving up and we should be invested because we don't want to miss out on this roller coaster ticking up slowly. 
See, the stock market is a lot like a roller coaster. If you ever rode uh, some of these older roller coasters, you're in the car and you hear this ticking noise, which is a safety kind of clamp that just clicks over so you can't fall backwards. And you just that anticipation, you're moving up slowly, slowly, and all of a sudden you go down violently. That's how the stock market feels. Like you'll be in this long period of five to eight years where stock prices are going up slowly, but surely ticking up and you feel, you know, confident, but then you start getting the feeling like, okay, something bad's going to happen because it's just too, or too high right now. And then when the stock market crash happens, it's like hurtling down at 80 miles per hour on a roller coaster. It just happens so fast. Faster than you can actually move your money out of the stock market. And that's why they, they say, don't, and by the time you get to move your money and convince yourself you've got to rescue your money from the stock market, it could have already hit bottom. And it's going to turn around and move up. You know, if people took their money out last month, when the stock market went down 800, 900 points, they would have missed this turnaround coming back 1,100 points two weeks later. So you see how dangerous that can be. So typically, um, if, you could, if you could, market timing is a very hard thing to do on, on your total stock portfolio. Some people have done it successfully. Uh, that's why I wouldn't recommend mark, market timing your portfolio, but market timing a few key stocks. Because some stocks usually ride the forefront of these uh, aggressive moves higher and lower in stock prices. And we could tell that by beta. The higher the beta, the more aggressive. So if, if it looks like the, the, the bull market is sort of peak topping or peaking, you may want to just sell some of your higher beta, beta stocks in your portfolio and get a lower beta average, weighted average for your portfolio. Uh, if you're fearing a downward trend in the market and maybe move that money into some lower beta stocks. So you're still invested, but you're not going to, your, 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 your account won't react, your portfolio won't react as aggressively as the market would be if it's on a downward trajectory. This trend is a, a combination index where we take the number of stocks that move up, divide by the number of stocks that move down, and divide that by the division of the volume of the up stocks by the volume of the down stocks. So when the trend values are, it says here, when the trend values are lower, it's a bull market. When the trend values are higher, it's a bear market. So this is kind of using the number, both sides of the data, the volume and the number of stocks up and down into one index. And this could be, I don't really work with this, but I, I've seen people, it's a good overall indicator that if you're, I'm not really that expert or intimate with this, so I, I couldn't really tell you what the point where the signal would be, and it changes. It's like a floating target. So it's not just you could say one number. Um, you have to be a lot more studied on this to understand the movement patterns of it. The mutual fund cash ratio. This I do try to follow, and this is the amount of cash that mutual funds have. So high cash positions are a good um, predictor of future stock prices. So when mutual fund managers start to get nervous because people are selling their mutual funds, they're going to have to convert stocks to cash. And new money coming in, when maybe the stock market starts to turn a little bit, they'll get new cash in. They may want to be holding that into cash. So at a certain point, when this cash gets too high of a percentage in the mutual funds, they're going to have to invest that cash. So that's a good time to be buying before the mutual fund managers start moving their cash back into stocks which would have been like 2009. Once the mutual fund manager is there, their cash fund ratio gets a lot smaller like it is today, they don't have as much money. They're basically just moving their new money into stocks. They don't have a bunch of money saved up that they could also deploy into stocks. So this can kind of give you, uh, you know, it's a bull market when the, the cash that these mutual fund managers is very high is a very bull sign because they're going to eventually have to invest that. And when it's low, it's sort of a bear sign. And right now, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say low, but it's heading lower. So when it gets to a point where uh, the mutual fund managers are rather low on cash and just really using the new investments to buy their new shares of stock, that's when you know, there could be a quick turn. So if it gets to be a point where mutual fund managers understand that there's going to be a, uh, a bear market for a while, they're going to want to pull back and try, and, and try to accumulate some cash. Or at the very least, they may not be buying any new stock and just holding on to any new contributions until they feel like it's a good time to buy. So the mutual fund managers, the amount of cash they have is a good indi technical indicator. Yeah. On balance volume, and this is where we're, we're going to track the volume 
uh, to price changes in the relationship. So we're going to create a, another type of chart related relationship. So we're going to look at the up volume occurs when a stock closes higher. So we're looking at, think of this as an individual stock. So when the stock price actually closes higher, we want to we see what the volume is compared to when the stock price closes lower and we get the down volume. Um, so we can, so if the stock price closes higher, we add that volume. The stock price closes lower, we start to subtract that volume. And we can plot that on a chart. Um, so we can kind of look at the amount of buy-in to the, to the movements. So any day the stock price moves higher, we're going to add volume. So volume would be the number that we will plot on the chart. You know, 5 million shares, 6 million shares. But we have, you know, so if it's the volume's up and the stock price is up, we plot that higher. But then we start subtracting volume on the downward days. So that's when it can go lower. So we have, if we have, you know, 10 days the stock price moves higher, all that volume gets added up for 10 days. It gets a pretty big peak. And then if it's a, sh a day where the, uh, the stock price goes lower, they subtract the volume and we're going to come off that peak. So that could give us another type of chart. Uh, we'll say it's a, bear, it's a bull market when the volume chart is going higher, continues to go upward, and then of course a bear market when the volume starts to come down because that means people are selling. So it's just a different type of chart to look at mixing volume with price movement. And this is really how you sort of calculate momentum. So if you have uh, a stock that's, uh, say, four out of six days it moves higher, but the volumes on the days it moves higher are more significant on the couple days that, the, that it moves lower. So you can sort of start to see this, you know, trend higher. And that's momentum. So no stock moves higher every day all the time. Some, every stock has their downward days. But if we plot these on the chart in, in, in using volume as sort of our, what we're plotting and the, the direction of the stock, we can actually start to see momentum develop. So if we have a stock that had a lot of downward momentum based on this chart and suddenly starts to move higher, there, there's more volume and more days the stock moves up, we know that that's a stock we should buy because we want to buy the momentum stocks. A lot of stocks are like jet aircraft. There's a significant point of time where it's going to go from zero feet to 10,000 feet. And it keeps generally moving in that direction. And then it will level off. And eventually it could level off for a while, changing altitudes here and there, but then it's going to land at some point. So stocks are a lot like a jet. There's that initial phase where they run up very fast to, to a high level. That's the phase you want to be in when that momentum phase is occurring. Because then there'll be a really long time, um, like Microsoft, that traveled around you know, $25, between $25 and $30 for a while before it moved up to its next elevation. And then some stocks can be quite high and then they just land and it's over. It's just not a good stock anymore. So I like to think of when I like to buy stocks, I want to get in at the, at the momentum phase and then hold on to see if it's going to have a second momentum phase. You know, moving from, it could be, you know, sort of like Under Armour. They started with t-shirts, then they moved into cleats, and they moved into all sorts of gym wear, and then sneakers and shoes, and athletic shoes. So every time they get into a new business and do well, it's a new elevation they reach. But eventually, they get to a peak, and there's no place but down. You know, they run out of, that's what a lot of people worry about with Apple. What is Apple's next device? It sure isn't the iWatch, or the watch, whatever they call it. That's a, no one wants that. So what is, they're just going to keep selling more of what they have, which is fine, but you can't get to the next level. When Apple created the iPhone, it brought them to the next momentum level. When they created the iPad, it brought them to the next even higher momentum level. What's the next product they're going to create to get them to that next momentum level? A lot of people say there isn't. They probably won't. So they'll probably just coast for a while, and eventually the competition will catch up to a point where no, they'll decline because now other companies' products are just as good. Okay, so charting. So in, in the technical analysis world, charting is sort of, I've been giving you some of the indicators we can chart, but charting is a big deal as far as how you're going to find activity. And we're going to look for formations. And if you go to uh, my YouTube channel, I have a couple of uh, uh, stocks that I did some charting technical analysis on that um, I wouldn't say you should buy and sell these stocks, uh, but I do some technical analysis if you look. I think the first one I have on the, the main page is like iRobot. I might have Macy's or 
uh, Microsoft, a couple of them that you could look at and just get some idea of, of kind of the way I, I would technically look at a, a, a company. And I usually use charts when I'm talking about it. And what we want to see, we want to point out where the line of resistance is and the line of support. So we're looking at formation patterns in the stock to give us these positions of support and resistance. These are some example um, patterns we could see that are going to point out breakouts and support. So you can see where the stock is, is going above a, a resistance line, we call that a breakout. And if it goes below a support level, we, that would be a breakout on a downward side. So certain patterns like a triple peak, uh, flag and pendant, or head and shoulders, a triple top, triangles, inverted saucer, these are all patterns. These are very um, generic patterns though. I prefer to use my technical analysis moving averages. And I, use, I like to use the moving average to track the, you know, the data of the stock price to look for, you know, to smooth out the daily fluctuations is one good thing that the moving averages do. And then I can better, I can better able predict support and breakouts based on these moving averages. So here's a 100 day moving average and we'll say that if the stock goes below See right here we have the stock breaking the resistance of the moving average and that's a buy sign. And here if it goes below the moving average it's a sell, then another buy and here's another sell, it goes low and you know it just and that's when traders will buy back and forth and do more frequent trading based on if you're using technical analysis to do market timing of your stock you might be buying and selling kind of frequently. And that's one thing that a lot of um, so I'll use the technical analysis only on the extremes on the buy side and sell side. Some of the, you know, I'll look for multiple indicators, not just one. Like this is showing us one indicator when buying to sell. All right. So um, I'm going to actually take you to back to Yahoo Finance. And if we look at, actually we could look at this There's a technical, basic technical analysis chart that we can pull up from Yahoo Finance that you can work with. And actually, they recently, I guess they recently changed this. I want to add um, some moving averages. day. And another moving average, 50 day. All right. So, six month. Okay, that's too much time. Three months might be better. So this is a very a volatile chart here, but you can see here that this should be in two different colors. Let me move over the, it's so crazy about the new charts, but here is, uh, this would be the first buy sign when it, when it passes the first moving average, the second buy sign when it passes the second moving average, and the third buy sign is when the, um, 50 day moving average finally goes above the 100 day moving average. And you can see that the stock has continued, it had a huge peak here, but then, um, so if you would have bought in, I guess on the, actually on the third, you could have got part of this peak, although it would have came down quite a bit, but it's still trading in a pattern where the stock price is above the, the 50 day and the 100 day moving average which would say that this is actually a holding period that you would hold the stock at this position. Because as long as the stock price is above the two moving averages, it's said to have higher momentum. But you really would want to, you probably would want to purchase back here when it went above the uh, 50 and the 100, or two buy signals. And here it tested the support. 
So if the stock is above the moving average, the moving average becomes the support. When it's below it, it's the resistance. So here it broke through two resistances. So, so two, when it breaks through two resistance levels, that's a buy, double buy sign. If it, if it bounces off the support, that's also a buy sign, showing that the, the moving average won't go below the moving average. That's the support where people buy more. So you could see, if you were watching these signals, you could have got the stock before a huge run-up. Although there is no signal really to show you to sell based to get off that peak. But that's, this is a very unusual stock where let's look up a different stock. Maybe uh, who is this grumpy old man? Reminds me of one of my professors. Let's look up GoPro. This is another volatile stock that, um, okay, so the top of the stock was $98, almost 100. It's back down to 76. The, 50, uh, the low is $28. So let's look at the technical indicators on this. This is a three-month chart. Let's add a, um, supposedly it has the two. Oh, you know what? Maybe I need to uh, put stock price in there. Oh, maybe this is it. All right. So I'm assuming this is the stock price and this is, one of the moving averages, unless the two moving averages are so uh, close. Let's see. All right, so we'll work with the one moving average, but let's put it in. Yeah, that's true. So it's probably just a 50 in there. Okay, so then we could add, maybe we could do a 25 day. And change the 100 to 25. Okay. All right. So here's the, uh, this is the 50 day, here's the 25 day uh, averages. And the stock has a relatively new stock. But you can see here that it was doing very good in the beginning. And it got into this here where it broke, it broke the support. Now here's, it's testing the support, but it can't break through. So it can't create a breakthrough on the 50-day, on the, on the uh, this is the 25-day moving average because it's longer. The shorter one is the 50-day. So it can't break through uh, the 25-day the moving average, but it, it sort of also bounces off the support of the 50-day, even though it kind of went below it a bit here. But finally, it broke above the 25-day, only to, to go below it again. And right now, it's trading between the 50 and the 25-day moving average. So this would be a stock that I would, at this point, I would probably sell. Because it is having a real hard time uh, existing above the two, breaking out the, between the two moving averages. And it could create a sell, I could, I mean, I would sell and wait for buy signals to, to come back in the stock later on. I, the stock could go down to say $50 and suddenly we'll see the moving averages reset and then, and then, then start breaking support levels and that could be a buy sign. But right now, this would look like the, the better days are over for the stock. Okay. And if we look at uh, Yelp, This is another similar stock that was at 100 at one point of the year and then down to 50. Okay. So let's go to a two year. And 
we could we could change we can add a hundred day back into it so we have a hundred twenty five and fifty back to a year it's too much going on there okay and let me take out the 25 it's not needed okay so here we go finally I got two colors the um, the, the 150 day and you can see here that here is what we like we have the, the red 50 day above the green 100 day and the stock price above it and over back here, we have the stock price finally becoming above both the 50-day the and 100-day stock. This is the last one I'll go over, and then we'll finish it for today. And you can see how well that momentum went. Then it finally, a sell sign is a breakout below the 50-day, and then a breakout below the 100-day. Double, double sell sign. And you see how low that stock price went. And then and eventually, as soon as it pierced the, um, and then when the, the 20, the 50 day goes and pierces the 100 day, a triple sell sign. So we have one, two, three sell signs. Uh, and then the buy signs start to come back in. It, peer, it, it breaks the uh, resistance of the, the 50 day, then the 100 day, and then the, the 50 day breaks above the 100. So right here we have our three buy signs. And we can see that there's a nice jump up in the stock price. But then again, one, two, three sell signs. And you see how the stock prices move lower. So right now, Yelp is in a technical sell area. 